currents. And probably you've all seen this picture of in your bachelor's, uh, in your bachelor's on, on high school and the magnetic field equations. And Dynamo, it's really, um, they, they do come up in all uh, sizes and shapes. And, but the main thing is that they convert mechanical energy from something to movement, um, movement into electrical currents. This is like um, for most people, uh, what the dynamo is. But um, these huge, well, huge or not so huge, uh, these cold structures are not found in space. Um, so why do we find magnetic fields in, in planets or um, galaxies and stars? Um, to explain that, we need to go uh, one further step, which is dynamo theory. And dynamo theory concerns the generation of magnetic fields from the flow of an electrically conducting fluid. That's the important part, electrically conducting fluid, which, is not, which are not um, wires, but it's a complex movement of electrically conducting fluid, um, which is relevant to sun, planets, stars, and galaxies. <coughs> um, so the, the sentence would need to be changed, at, and dynamo action would be the conversion of kinetic energy <coughs> to magnetic energy, or in other words, um, fluid flow that amplifies the magnetic field. Um, this is the scary slide about of equations. <laughs> so this is the, uh, I'll show you the full set of magnetohydrodynamic equations. And the first one, it's co the continuity equation, which is only mass conservation. When you go to a fluid element and you say, um, how does the density changes? It changes uh, um, uh, about um, of how much the, there's flux in the walls of this fluid element. And you get this first equation. Um, the other equations are applied in the, into a same fluid uh, element. And one of them is the momentum equation, which is um, Newton's second law, which is mass times acceleration equals all the, all the forces. And these are the usual forces that you have, which is pressure, the Lorentz force, uh, viscosity, and this F refers to any other kind of forcing. There's also an energy conservation equation, which is it's the a usual thing. You don't have to look at it to, to, to look. And the other one, which is the most important one, which is the induction equation, which is it comes from joining Maxwell's equation uh, with uh, with a fluid, uh, an electric, electrically conducting fluid. Um, the two most important equations are these two: the Newton's second law and the induction equation. And the relation between these two is what makes uh, MXZ such a rich theory. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, you see that uh, this first equation um, states how the velocity field changes. It's uh, the derivative, the time derivative of u, the velocity. And this second states how the magnetic field changes in time. And they're both intertwined because the flow changes the magnetic field and the magnetic field changes the flow. Um, yeah, I'll see more about this. Yeah. Uh, in, a, in the beginning of a MHZ simulation, usually you don't have a magnetic field. You, put, you only put a seed, uh, a minimal seed. Therefore, this term here does not affect yet. So what you have is that the magnetic field does not influence the flow, but the flow influences the magnetic field. And um, depend, depending on which flow you have here, you will get or not get uh, magnetic field growth. And dynamo action is the physical process by which fluid flow amplifies or maintains a magnetic field. And the thing that these equations I showed you have almost no um, analytical solution, solutions. And, but what theory predicts is that when you have some kind of flow that indeed makes a magnetic field grow, this growth will be exponential during the linear phase, which is this phase where the magnetic field is um, small enough for this term not to influence. So even though there are no analytical solutions, there are some anti-dynamo theorems. What are those? There are some theorems that state where there cannot be a dynamo. And some of them are these two that, that say that an axisymmetric magnetic field cannot be maintained. So you cannot have a pure dipole or a planar flow in two dimensions cannot create a magnetic field. And there are some others, which always stay the same, that we cannot achieve dynamo action 
with a simple flow. And a simple magnetic field, which has a lot of geometry, cannot be generated by dynamo action. So the, the thing is that we need complex flows that twist and that twist and um, the magnetic field. And which kind of kinds of flows um, are there? There, there's a, an examples of some of them. Uh, in stars, for example, you have differential rotation. Right? When you have a dipole, uh, a dipole, and the star rotates, you probably know that the star does not rotate at the same speed uh, on the um, on the latitude. So the magnetic field lines are twisted, and when you twist them and 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 recoil them and they rejoin, you get a magnetic a magnetic field growth. Another kind of is turbulence. Turbulence is um, random motion in a fluid. And there's also this kind, these other two, shear and convection. These both are found um, everywhere. And they also lead to turbulence. But the difference between turbulence and these two is that when you have shear or convection, they might lead to turbulence, but they also might lead to big motions through the, through the body. Like, when you have only turbulence, you will only get small magnetic field. But if you have shear or convection, you might get a, a growth of the big scale magnetic field. So as always physics do, they um, undermine some of the terms. And these are the two terms of the induction equation, which is called the induction term, which this is what makes the field growth, and the diffusion term. Why is it called diffusion? First, OK. Um, there are two limits. When the diffusion term is negligible, you have a perfectly conducting fluid. And this perfectly conducting fluid um, is called ideal MHD, uh, uh, the ideal MHD model, which has a, a, a huge frozen flux theorem behind, and it's one of the pillars of MHD. Um, but what I wanted to go is to the diffusive limit. It, it's when the induction equation, either induction term, does not play a role. This diffusive limit, which you get this small equation, predicts a decay, a decay of magnetic field. And why is this important? Because this decay time from, for all these, for all these, for example, these four objects, is of this order. Um, you can see that the Earth has about ten to a hundred uh, thousand years of magnetic field decay. Also, more or less the same for Jupiter even though the Sun and the Milky Way have big um, time decays, but there's, there's another thing that plays a role that is turbulent magnetic diffusion that when you have turbulence, this decay is faster. Why, did, what are, why am I showing you this? It's because if we have magnetic decay, but no generation of magnetic field, we would have not, no magnetic fields in these objects because it would have decayed by now. And I did not remember this number, and this week I searched. I made uh, the big mistake of putting this on Google, Earth magnetic field decay. And this was the plot, the first plot that it showed me. You can see on the, on the x-axis how during Christ's life, we have a bump in the magnetic field. <laughs> but no, this is the real plot. Um, yeah. The, the magnetic field of the Earth changes a lot. And this, the white stripes, is when the magnetic field of the Earth has the polarity it has right now. And the black stripes, it's when it's reversed. And this big stripe is the last 5 million years. And this long stripe is the last 160 million years. And you can see that um, it's quite stochastic, quite random, when it, it um, decides to change polarity. This is not the case for the sun. The sun, if you know, has a 22-year cycle that it changes polarity every 11 years. And it's quite, um, quite exact. So this, all this, um, these are the two best measured magnetic fields. And they both have cycles, and they vary. So there mu there's, must be some MHZ going on there. And what about the other planets? OK. The Earth has magnetic field, the Moon had in the past, the four giant they do, Venus does not. Uh, Mars had in the past, and Ga Mercury has it right now, and Ganymede. 
uh, is the only moon that has it right now. Maybe because the other moons have not been measured well enough to say if there's small magnetic field or not. And probably nobody um, states otherwise that exoplanets will have magnetic fields having this example. And these are more or less the shapes of them. You can see that Mercury, Saturn, and Ganymede both have quite axisymmetric, which is a mystery because in theory, there cannot be axisymmetric magnetic fields. And the Earth and Jupiter are more or less dipolar, but have different shapes. And Uranus and Neptune, they look a bit weird, but it's because their axis is completely tilted. So it's also mainly dipolar, but it's <clears throat> 90 degrees or 90 something or 80 something. And well, how do we measure these magnetic fields? We measure them directly with magnetometers or by radio emission. <coughs> and radio emission is what now we will use in principle to detect the first magnetic fields in, um, in exoplanets. And these are the, the, some examples of um, radio telescopes that are looking right now for um, exoplanet emission of related to magnetic fields. And when a magnetic field is measured, when, when the data is published, what they actually publish is a set of constants, G and Hs. And this set of constants are actually coefficients for spherical harmonics. And for example, for the Earth, you have um, the International Geomagnetic Reference Field, which every five years they publish a whole set of, of constants of how the magnetic field changes. And if you've seen, there's the, the magnetic field is changing a bit. I can put it back again. Uh, it dates back to the 1900s. And you can see how this is the radial field. In blue means that the radial field is going in. In red means that it's going out. And this is the, the modulus of the magnet, magnetic field. And I don't know if you know, but there's a, a big um, low in the magnetic field around South America. And a lot of um, satellites, when they go over this region, they have to be turned off because the magnetic field protects from solar radiation. And in this part of, the, of their orbits, they are less protected by the Earth. And sometimes the, their, their, their equipment could be damaged. Um, this actually. This plot is the same as this one I'm showing here, but this one is at 0 0.55, 0 0.55, the radius of the Earth, which is where it's where the the fluid, the core fluid, should start. Um, okay, you can see a bit how this, for example, this red spot is moving through the west, and this is supposed to be the speed by which the fluid motions happen inside the core, and which are of the order of one millimeter per second. And yeah, I did not explain this, but when they give this two set of constants, you um, they are using um, the, cur um, the current free approximation, which is outside the, the electrically conducting fluid, there's no field generation, and you can approximate the magnetic field with this potential. So you cannot use this approximation below 0.55, because below 0.55, the fluid core starts and this approximation it does not work. And for Jupiter, we have the same, si the same thing, because uh, there's a, a mission called Juno, which went around 30 something times around Jupiter. And they also published a set of constants, which can be used to reproduce the magnetic field of, of Jupiter. And a curious fact is that this is the modulus and this is the radial field. Um, on the north, there's the true north pole, or on the south, there's the south, but there's this spot here, which is like a south pole in the equator. And it's called the great blue spot. And it's called blue because they always like to put blue for the negative, but it's actually accepted. Everybody calls it the great blue spot. And it has nothing to do with the great red spot. They lie, the great blue spot lies in this, uh, more approximately at the equator and the red blue spot lies below. Yeah. 
So this problem has many, many different constants that we can vary, which are obvious. <laughs> Um, the, the same that share the color is the is the same the same parameter, and the, the yellow ones are all different. Uh, for the explosions, for example, we can change their 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 amplitude, their frequency, and their width of the how how big it is in um, in relation to the box. And we can also change. I, I have not explained this, but we can also change the omega, which is the rotation. We can change the shear. Um, we can change the, the viscosity, the electro, the, and the magnetic diffusivity. So the question is, can and um, look that this force, this forcing is only applied on the momentum equation. A lot of other forcings are also applied in the entropy or energy equation. So this is a bit simple. But the question is, can this kinetic forcing um, generate dynamo action by itself? And actually, there are two papers that they use this forcing. They did not use MHD. They only used hydrodynamics with the magnetic field. And they, mm, we copied a bit what they did, adding the magnetic field and trying some different kinds of um, parameter states. So how does uh, <coughs> time evolution, mm, what a time evolution look like? So once the, all the, the explosions have saturated the box, um, they look like this, and how, in the, for example, this mean velocity starts going up and reaches a plateau. And uh, if you look at the pink and yellow ones, this is without rotation, zero, and this is with rotation, it has a value of two. And the one with rotation reaches more, more velocity, for example. And on the bottom, you see that it's the same plot as the top, but not the mean velocity, the maximum velocity. And this maximum velocity more or less is the same for all of them. And this is because the maximum velocity is actually set by the explosions, not the rotation or anything else. And actually, I've lied to you, this is not the velocity. This is the Reynolds number. And this kind of dimensionless numbers are used because what does it mean? This mean velocity was 0.3. What does it mean, 0.3, in code units? It means nothing unless you put units to it. But if you use the Reynolds number, which is the this speed by the length um, multiplied by the, the typical length of the problem divided by the, the viscosity, you get a number. And I don't know if you've heard of Reynolds numbers and this. These are supposed to be dimensionless, and you can compare other simulations and other kinds of physics using this kind of number. And the other thing is vorticity. Vorticity is the curl of velocity. And if you wait to turn, if, and if you take the curl of this equation, you end up with this equation, which is all the sources of turbulent motion. What is turbulent motion? Turbulent motion is the motion that will create, will um, create magnetic field growth. So if there was nothing here, you would not have turbulent motion and you would not have magnetic field growth. And note that the forcing is here. And when you take the curl, the forcing is not here anymore because it's a potential forcing. And if you take the curl, it goes away. So in principle, this forcing by itself could not create vorticity and could not create dynamo. But if you put other ingredients like this, which is um, rotation, you, these ones are the ones with, without rotation, only with, for, with forcing, and they have zero vorticity. And the other ones, they have but, oh yeah, I have to explain what a spectra is. Uh, the spectra I showed you about the planets, there's, um, there's the same thing about these cubic, um, cubic simulations. And what is a spectra? It's a 3D Fourier transform. And as the, uh, when you make simulations, you don't have a continuum media. You have a discretized media. So the, the equation looks a bit more awful. And, but when you apply this equation to here, you get something like this. What is this spectra? This spectra is how much energy is in different um, scales. For example, this is the peak of the energy, which will, prob will, will, probably, will probably be where we put the forcing. For example, if the forcing is a tenth of the box, 
this peak will be in a tenth of the in the wave number ten. The wave number number one would be a, a, a sine function all through the box, and a, a wave number ten would be ten ten sine sine oscillations. And the typical behavior is that when when you have turbulence, this first when you put energy in a in a specific um, length scale, then it diffuses away to smaller smaller um, length scales. And this is what we see. Um, this blue, orange, and pink one, they all have the same explosion width, and they, have, they all have the, the peak in the same place. And the green one has uh, the, the, whole, the whole box is the size of the explosion. And you can see that the green one has the, the maximum of energy in the whole box because the explosion occupies the whole box and not the other ones. And you see that they all have the same slope, means that they have the same kind of physics behind. And what happens with rotation, for example? With rotation, it's the two, the, the yellow one, the slope, the slope gets steeper. This, mean that, this means that small scales are, no, large scales are a bit enhanced, which is typical for rotation. Rotation normally inhibits smaller scales. When you have rotation, for example, when a planet rotates faster, it's more difficult to have smaller scales. And usually, dynamo action is a bit um, not enhanced. But on, on, on all of these simulations I showed you, we put an initial magnetic field, which is quite slow, uh, small, 10 to the minus 17. <coughs> and they all decay. This is the first, <coughs> the first snapshot, and they all decay. Uh, and we tested a lot of different parameters, a lot of different rotations, a lot of different forcings, and we could not get dynamo action. And actually here, they are both. What happens is that the pink one is below the, the yellow one, that they both fall at the same time. I mean, I, I think we threw, we threw like 100 or something simulations, and none of them grew magnetic field. Only those that then crashed quickly, so we can couldn't rely on the results. And this decay only depended on the resolution. But it did not depend if, um, if we had rotation or not rotation or the, the, the energy equation or only um, isothermal equation. It did not depend on that. But when we put uh, shear, which is, you don't have to look at it. Uh, if you look at the explosions on the bottom, on the top of the box, you can see that they are shifted. It's because throughout the box, we apply like these kinds of shear. And the thing is that this boundary condition, you cannot, you cannot put the same boundary condition. It cannot be periodic because this, um, this side of the box is going that way and that one is going this way. You cannot say that whatever enters here goes here. So that was a problem. And that was a problem because vorticity, this is another measure of vorticity, from zero to a little bit of shear made a jump, which is discontinuous, and this cannot be. And the reason why is because the, this boundary condition was interfering with, the, with our forcing. And all the vorticity and the magnetic field growth, because here we had magnetic field growth, all happened in the, in the phases. And we tried putting the faces, the explosions only in the half of the middle of the box. And it's, you cannot almost see this here, but all the explosions are here. And if you integrate the, the velocity, this is the explosions throughout the box, and this is the explosions in the middle of the box. <laughs> what happens? Something weird also. Even though um, the explosions are only in the middle, you create vorticity in the middle, but you also mainly create vorticity in the, in, the, in the boundary conditions. And the magnetic field, it grew a bit. So even though we could not trust these results, it looked like these kinds of sh this shear could create uh, dynamo growth. And we went for sinusoidal shear, which is a bit more complex, which means that, that there's a side of the box that is going that way and the top of the box, which is going this way. Why are we using this? Because this has no boundary condition problems. You can 
you can use um, all the periodic boundary conditions. And using this um, shear, we got a magnetic field growth, which is this blue thing that started much lower than the, the kinetic energy. And then it grew and reached the same level of kinetic energy. But before this, um, this magnetic field grew, we had uh, a growth in velocity and vorticity, <clears throat> which means that this is not only a dynamo, a dynamo instability. It means that first it's a hydrodynamic instability <clears throat> that then leads to a, a magnetic hydrodynamic instability. And this is, has a resemblance to a typical kelvin Helmholtz, which is only a resemblance because kelvin Helmholtz, <laughs> you in principle have a sharp boundary that has different speeds. This is not, this was not sharp, it's a steam soil, but it has some resemblance. And it looks like there's some papers that had this vorticity generation with shear turbulence, which means that only using shear and some forcing, you get like an explosion, an exponential growth of vorticity and, and kinetic energy. And in our case, after that, we get magnetic field growth. Because if you see the, the, the yellow, <clears throat> The yellow lines are the hydrodynamic, only hydrodynamics with no magnetic field, and the blues are with magnetic field. And first, they are the same, but when magnetic field, when the magnetic field starts uh, playing a role, the magnetic, uh, the kinetic energy decreases, and they both reach the same level, which is called equipartition, because they share the same energy. So this is how it looks like before the growth, the the dynamo instability instability and after the dynamo instability. Before you have these nice sinusoidal structures with the explosions and after that it's a bit more chaotic. Vorticity grows, which is, this is not in the same scale, this is 10 times. Smaller. In density you can see that the magnetic field created looks um, a bit real. I, I say real because in the other simulations we threw, we only saw a magnetic field that was a bit patchy and very bad because we were testing the code too much without the shear. And this is the exponential growth that we got, which is indeed exponential because it's a lot axis, which first is a, a, a vorticity growth and then the dynamo growth. And what happens if you change the shear, this A, this amplitude of the shear? Uh, if you take away the, the, the red one, the other four ones look like a series, and they are a series. They are a series of increasing this amplitude. This amplitude, the yellow is 0.1, the blue is 0.15, and you can see that they, the growth is faster with more amplitude of this shearing motion. And yeah, and the, the red one, you should compare it with the purple one. They are the same, but the purple one is isothermal, it has the same temperature everywhere. And this one has not. This one is, um, you, you, we are solving the, the energy equation also. And solving the energy equation leads to a bit more rapid vorticity growth because it, gen it's help, it helps generate more vorticity. And this, this plot, um, what happens if this plot we divide it into the components of x, y, and z motion. We get this plot. Um, that the total energy is on the white stripe. And you see that during the dynamo, all three components have the same importance. But right after, you can see that the y component is gets amplified more than the others. And before the dynamo growth, also the Y component was the main, the main part. And this is because a thing called magnetic field winding. That when the induction, if you put in the induction equation our shear profile, you have an, amp, uh, an amplification of, which is not exponential, of magnetic field in the Y direction due to the magnetic field in the Z direction. So when after we have magnetic field, one of the components uh, get the preferential treatment, which is the y direction. This does not happen, for example, with vorticity, and not 
as much as with velocity. They are more or less on the same level. Uh, and what happens with the spectra before and after? Before, you have this spectra, which is the same, similar to the explosions I said, and this peak. This peak is the sinusoidal shear, which is um, the full box. So th that's why the wave number is zero. And when you have the dynamo growth, you get um, this, that all scales are more or less the same, not here because of the shear, but right after this y, this zone, the y component gets a bit enhanced for this thing I told you. The, thing, the same thing happens to the magnetic field. In, in, at the beginning, there was only in, in the y component, but be aware of the, of the, of the y-axis because this is much lower. This is before the dynamo growth. And during the dynamo growth, all the three components share the same importance. And after the dynamo growth, after the magnetic field winding, you get you all, the main contribution of the magnetic energy is in the, in the y direction. Uh, you can see this slope, which is 1.5. This is a slope typical, which is called Kazantzev slope, which is predicted by theory when you have magnetic, uh, when you have dynamo action. It's predicted that in principle it should be 1.5, which we got. And this is vorticity, which is more or less, has more or less the same behavior as magnetic and vorticity. Uh, at, at, in the beginning, it has the, the structure of the sinusoidal shear, then it grows, it gets more or less um, isotropic, and by the end, it, um, it has again this shearing structure. And this is a video of, of the magnetic field growth. Of, yeah, let me, of these four, these four stimulations. Four different, she four different shears. You can see that the red one going up first. This is the magnetic energy. They go up um, 15 orders of magnitude. And this here is both the magnetic and kinetic energy. The kinetic is uh, in a solid line, and the magnetic is in a dashed line. And I can put it again. And you can see that right after the kinetic energy grows a bit, the magnetic energy reaches on the same level. I'm thinking out the, the simulations when they're they are too long. And you can see that they reach, almost reach a co-partition. There is the, the same level of energy between magnetic field and kinetic. And all of these simulations are unit agnostic. It means that they do not have units. Um, but you can start putting them units. For example, the length of the, of the box was 2 pi. And you can say, OK, this 2 pi corresponds to 500 parsecs. The density is one. Well, this unit corresponds to this density. And the sound speed is one, which corresponds to 10 kilometers per second, which is, this is not true for, galact for a galactic plane. And we can interpret these boxes as a cubic box on the plane of the galaxy, more or less. And once you've set, you've put uh, um, some, some units into the game, then you can derive a lot of other units. And just to give you, uh, a reason. These two or three supernova explosions per hundred year per galaxy can be translated <clears throat> into more or less uh, one to five supernova explosions per mega year per 500 parsecs cube, which is a bit weird. Thinking it, it will, but. And putting these equations, we got uh, a frequency explosion rate of six, which is more or less the same order. And using this, we got the, the magnetic field of the order of the galactic field. Uh, what we are lying about is the sound speed. The sound speed is a bit higher, uh, at least an order of magnitude higher than this that we set. And this is because we want to put the, the shear speed around this magnitude. Either we have to, to sacrifice the shear speed or the sound speed. <clears throat> so this, when you always put uh, units on this code, you always have to sacrifice some, some magnitude. Yeah, and the other magnitudes that are far, far away are the Reynolds number that I showed you before. They usually in the astrophysical settings are 10 to the 15, 10 to the 30, and here we can reach 300. <laughs> it's a bit bad, but everybody accepts the results more or less. So as conclusions for this project uh, is that these random expansion waves 
create no dynamo when you have only rotation or variochemicity within this number, within, within this range of numbers that we tested. But this sinusoidal shear creates first a hydrodynamic instability and then leads to dynamo action, which by the end leads to a partition between kinetic and, and turbulent. And there are a lot of papers that, that um, simulate supernovas, very good. Very good, I mean, they use, uh, they put a long box and they simulate um, the stratification that in the, in the center of the, of the box, it's a lot dense and then it goes farther away as in the disk of the galaxy. And then they use the multi-phase um, equations. They use self-gravity. They use a bunch of other, um, other ingredients and they do get magnetic field growth. But the thing is that you, don't know, you do not need all these ingredients only with these explosions, only in the, in the kinetic part, not in the thermal part, only in the kinetic explosions with shear, you can achieve a dynamo. And this, is, this has been the first project I've been um, involved, in, involved in. And now we are finishing writing the, the paper, which will be in the archive within a month or two, hopefully. <laughs> hopefully. <Nice. laughs> so uh, now I'll, I'll, okay. No. Okay, I'll speak about the, the rest of my PhD, what I'm going to do, which is the same, this, this kind of equation, MHD codes, but for stars and planets. But this, these equations are the same as I showed you before, but applied in a spherical shell. And these equations, when you transform them, they're a bit more messy and they're bigger, they have more weird numbers and they're a bit harder to understand. And they also use, sometimes they, have another equation, which is chemical composition, which chemical composition can vary through the, through the radius of the, of the planet or star, and it can give further um, convection terms, which usually the convection is given by difference of temperature, but when you have difference in chemical composition, you also can get um, convection. <coughs> okay, we st have started using MAGIC, which is one of these codes, and to use one of these simulations, you have to give, choose a set of equations because there are different kinds of approximations. You have to um, choose a set of non-dimensional parameters that are these ones, which were all throughout these equations, this Ekman number, Rayleigh number, Prandtl numbers, weird numbers, that, that what they are, are like um, divisions of, of, of force terms. Like, the, the viscous force divided by the Coriolis force is the Ekman number. And all these numbers do set different, different starting points for, for planets and stars. And you choose boundary conditions and a numerical resolution. And after that, you get or not get dynamo growth. And, and you can study how, if this magnetic field that is created, um, what, it's, what is its topology, if it's mainly dipolar, multipolar, etc. And there are a lot of papers using these kinds of simulations. And already in 1995, there was the first paper that um, could simulate a field, uh, an Earth field reversal, that it, uh, that it had uh, a run, uh, the inner core, which has random fluid, uh, random motions. And after a while, it gets multipolar. And after a while, you recover this same structure, but inversed, which this was a, a great deal. This guy, Blatzmeyer, is quite famous in, in his field because he, he got this kind of field reversal. Field reversal. And now the, the simulations get are a bit more, more advanced. This, this is the Ekman, two numbers of the Earth, which are quite small and quite big. And the simulations are 10 to the minus 3, 10 to the minus 5. And what they want to do is to make a series of simulations that approach these numbers to get some kind of physical answer to what will be the structure in the Earth. This is what some of them do. And, and Jupiter, uh, uh, yeah, this, this was for the geodynamo, for the magnitude of the Earth. And for Jupiter dynamos, you also have a lot of different kinds of studies, which, is, which are a bit more complex because you have radially dependent, a lot of radially dependent mm, quantities, and they, they are a bit more complex and hard to read. Uh, what happens with this coast but that is that they do not evolve the geometry inside the planet. You start 
with a with a shell, and that shell does not change. What what about if the planet evolves and starts contracting? You cannot put this into these probes. They are too too complex. So what we aim to do is to use uh, a, a stellar evolution code, which is called, one of them is called MESA, which has a, a, a giant planet um, module that you can use to to evolve how how a giant planet contracts and everything. We want to use this code to extract a lot of radial profiles and fit these radial profiles to this MHD code and see how this um, magnetic field topology changes when the structure of the planet changes. So this is the main goal. And for example, uh, we fit it, uh, we've used these, these radial profiles and we fitted them to a six degree <coughs> poly radial polynomial and and well, we are getting there. We have no results to show yet, but we are um, right now. Gravity. We can use the gravity of Mesa in inside um, the events. So this is what I shall do for the next two years and a half. So yeah. There are questions for Albert. I have two. One is just trying to understand you are modeling this um, dipole in the galaxy, for example. Um, so basically, but, but you show this large scale structure of a magnetic field. So you are modeling only a small piece. Yeah. There seems to be like a large scale correlation. This is because the yeah, the yeah, galaxy has... align after that. Could mm. you just re repeat the question? Oh, yeah. <coughs> for... um, can you rephrase well, it? <laughs> yeah. No, well, the, that you, you explain, as I understood, you explain the dipole in a small scale, but you show us a picture of a very large scale dipole. I, I was wondering how these two things connect. Mm. Yes. yes. Mm. This one. So you, you are modeling one of these little uh, yeah, but yellow things, right? Actually, these yellow things are only showing the large scale structure of the galaxy, which means that also in the smaller scales, you have a, you also have structure. I mean, I, in the simulations I'm, I'm doing, it's a small box in here. And in principle, you have small scale structures there, but in principle, these small scale structures also at the end should lead to a big scale structure, which in more or less that's that's what we got with the shear. Right? The, at the beginning, the magnetic field was more or less random, and by the end, it aligned with the shear. And then the, the other question is: if you are talking about supernova explosions, we know that the, the, it involves relativistic speed. Yeah. And your equations no, no, no. are not, not relativistic. So highly not. Uh, <clears throat> yes, apart from that, is because the, the size of the explosions is 50 parsecs, and the, I don't know how much um, has decreased the velocity of the supernova when it's expanding to 50 parsecs. I don't know. But no, this is more like a, a theoretical work that could we get dynamo action using only expan uh, expansion waves? Because usually codes cannot get, MHD codes cannot get relativistic. They cannot even get to five mag numbers and when you when you try to use um, um, supersonic speeds usually codes crash and if they don't crash they are using some kind of dissipative mechanisms that um, a lot of people think that they are not feasible it's like a, a thing that you put in the code for in order to make to stabilize them and be able to um, model the the supersonic speeds so this is, is this is only theoretical coding reason. Other questions? Yes. Uh, thanks. Yeah. So when, when you were talking about that the, the code crash, the crash, is it because you know, there's physics that is missing the no the code or why exactly are they okay. crashing when you are doing speed? Um, yeah, um, Thomas asked, uh, why, do the codes why do the code crashes? Yeah. It's usually... Okay. 
Okay, when, when in this full set of equations, you put, for example, um, too low um, viscosity or too low um, resistivity, then um, things start growing way too much. And it's a finite difference code, which means that you take point, six points and you calculate the derivative with, with three points on the left and three points on the right. On the right. If, thing, if things get too high, these this derivatives explode. And then you, on, the, on the code, you, you start getting one point is positive, the other is negative, and you get a lot of granularity and everything explodes. And in a moment, there's some, some numbers are too big for the computer and the code crashes. It's because we are testing two big forcings, for example, and the mag number reaches four, or because we are we were going um, too low with the resistivities, which leads always almost always leads to too much. The the fluid is moving too fast for the code. But if you change the units and you fold that in a way, or yes, you gotta interpret this in a different way in different ways but using these code units we were not getting dynamo you can interpret them a lot of ways but you're not getting that I mean, but just like changing the scales right so you're having like a uh, number of ten thousand. you have uh... yeah but that's after the simulation is done i mean when you have this simulation you can start changing these non-dimensional parameters to see if this leads to dynamo action. If it leads to dynamo action, you can start then interpreting these units and choosing, okay, the density is the density of the earth. The viscosity is the viscosity of the earth. Then does this make sense on the earth? But if we are not getting dynamo action with this kind of parameters we were testing, we cannot interpret them in any way. We have a question online. Uh, so, Fabio, if you could uh, yeah. unmute. Yeah. Uh, can you hear me? Uh, yeah. Can you hear me? Yes. Albert, can you go to um, the slide where you show magnetic energy spectra? Which slide? So, the, you show the three stages of the simulation. For vorticity, uh, yeah, exactly. So you said mm, that you have small scale dynamo, which is for sure true because of what we see in the central plot, right? But on the right hand plot, actually, both from the visualization and from the spectra, you see that there is a large scale component, yeah. which is due to the shear. So this can help you also to um answer the previous question about the generation of large scale structures in the galaxy which of course is much more complex but don't you think that here uh, already in this uh, local simulation if we interpret the simulation as part of the galaxy you can see the generation of large scale magnetic field yeah yes during the magnetic field growth you can see that the peak of the magnetic field energy is around the, the explosion <laughs> length. And this is called small scale dynamo because the dynamo is in the same scale or less than the forcing. If the magnetic field grew bigger on the large scales, it would, call, it would be called large scale uh, dynamo. But only by the end when this, this dynamo phase has stopped and one magnetic field um, Direction gets preference treatment. It only has to be. Yeah. So but the, the, the set direction is the one where perpendicular to the shear, right? Yeah. In your simulation. And I guess it's the direction of the rotation of the yeah. galaxy. Yeah, and, and anyway, you see also large scale uh, generation also in, in the three components. Of course, in one component is much more uh, pronounced, but in the three components is present, I would say. Okay. Thank you. Last question. If not, 
Let's go in garden. Thank you, Albert.